The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. Talk Station, Faith Matters. Good morning, and welcome to Faith Matters on the Talk Station. We are here for another Sunday morning discussion of news items from a faith perspective. My name is Carl Zorowski. I'm the pastor at St. Peter's United Methodist Church. I'm joined this morning by Bill Clear, the pastor of Open Door Baptist Church, also here in Moorhead. And we're also joined this morning by Blake Larson, who is an associate pastor at Liberty Church in Havelock. Good morning, gentlemen. Hey, good morning, Blake. Good to see you. Good morning, Carl. Hey, good morning. It's uh, good. Really looking forward to it. Well, we're glad to have you here this morning. Our first article today comes from the United Methodist News Service, and it focuses on something that has probably touched the lives of a lot of our listeners, if not most of our listeners, and that is the reopening of churches after COVID. Not that churches were closed. The church has never been closed, but the sanctuaries were closed for a while, and churches are kind of getting their feet wet again and getting worship cranked back up. Some have been worshiping again in person for some time. Some have still not yet reopened their doors. But the article is entitled, Churches Urged to Relaunch, Not Just Reopen. And this article is by Sam Hodges, and uh, it comes out of Denton, Texas. Mr. Hodges writes, Worshiping in person is happening again at First United Methodist Church in Denton after a 400-day pause because of COVID-19. The Reverend Don Lee seemed about to levitate as he greeted a long line of the faithful after the June 6th reopening service. You are so beautiful, he called out with emotion, but glad as he is to be reunited. The senior pastor does not long for the pre-pandemic normality at First Denton. Lee and the Reverend Jonathan Perry, executive pastor of Strategic Leadership, intend to build on their church's success in reaching people online and through local TV broadcasts of service. They're looking at shaking up the worship service schedule, refocusing programs and outreach, and making certain that church spaces are more user-friendly. We have an opportunity, a rare opportunity, to relaunch our church, Lee said. Thousands of United Methodist churches in the U.S. are coming out from under pandemic restrictions, and amid the happy reunions, they're assessing what they've been through and what comes next. Church leadership Experts have become preachers in this moment, imploring clergy and lay leaders not to miss an opportunity for change. Tim Snyder, senior researcher at the Lewis Center for Church Leadership, asks, "Will we go back to those ways of being the church that have been steady de- that have been in steady decline for several decades now, or will we risk the possibility that the Spirit of God is once again about to make?" all things new. Even pastors whose churches are accustomed to growth agree the pandemic ignited innovation that needs to continue. I like to say we've been in a COVID-forced reformation, said Reverend Dwayne Anders, pastor of the Cathedral of the Rockies First United Methodist Church in Boise, Idaho. And that same feeling is felt by Margie Briggs, a lay minister whose experience leading to rural Missouri conference churches is captured in her memoir, Can You Just Get Them Through Until Christmas? Going to church is a habit, she said by phone. It's a good habit. But once you're out of the habit, it's hard to get back into it. One of her churches is seeing about 60% of its pre-pandemic attendance, and the other is at about 50%. Such percentages appear to be common. Still, a large majority of pastors responding to the UMC-COM survey feel 
hopeful. Gentlemen, I could read more of this article, but I'm sure the things that are in here are things that you're seeing yourselves in your church. Your yeah, numbers absolutely. are not what they were before COVID, but yet worship is also not what it was before COVID. Yeah, I think that uh, Open Door Baptist Church is falling very much in line with a lot of what's uh, being described in this article. Uh, you know, the the attendance numbers, uh, the you know, all, all of the the things that the um, the relationships that were not only strained but just the cohesiveness, you know, of of the the church body at large that uh, has been through so much. Uh, stress, you know, that's been placed on it uh, over these last uh, two years. Uh, yeah, so so I can certainly identify with a lot of what's going on uh, in this article. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that too, uh, even at Liberty. Uh, <clears throat> there are certain things just in functionality that are different, you know, immediately, you know, we stop passing baskets. We're not giving you something that somebody else has been touching. Right, here too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 when it comes to communion, we love to have a loaf of bread, you come up, tear off a piece. Well, we don't have a communal piece of bread. Right. <laughs> there's communion. There's different ways. But I think one of the things that has been harder is because we've still been pre- been pretty much able to provide preaching and worship online. It's not the same, of course, but it is there. Um, but you become used to that. I think the biggest thing is they become used to not having some of that fellowship with other church members. And that's harder to get back in the habit of. Right. Yeah. That that idea of habit that was picked up in this article is definitely something uh, that I, I'm you know talking to with my family at, at Open Door as well. Uh, what you just said, they uh, uh, Blake, they they get used to not having that fellowship, uh, and it's I mean it's like getting used to not having sunshine or or getting used to smog or something like yep. that, right? You're, we, we have, as a church, been slowly getting used to something that is that is suffocating, that's that's strangling. And in a way, we just kind of at this point say, uh, oh, could it be different? Could it be freeing? You know, and I and that's why um, part of the reason why I love the ideas that uh, that's talked about in this article of not reopening but relaunching. I think that's a a great thing for these, uh, especially these Methodist churches that they're talking about here. Sure, and and of course not just Methodist churches, but all churches. We've all had to rethink how we do worship, and once we reopened and again i hate to use that word reopened but i think everybody understands what i'm talking about once we reopened um we tried to shorten our services so people were not together in a group for a long time um and so we had to streamline things there were certain things that we've always done that we are no longer doing and i almost look at at covid has worked like a refiner's fire on the church because it has sort of forced us to let go of some of the things that are not essential. They may be wonderful and they may be traditional, but not everything that we were doing was essential. Yeah, Uh, and uh, I would really... uh, uh really appreciate it if you would not tell the folks at Open Door that you can actually shorten a, a service. Uh, <laughs> well, let know, me let they... <laughs> me let me assure you that that even though we've refined and removed some certain aspects of worship, the rest of it has somehow spread to fill that That's void. Right. That's so right. We're, yeah, I, we're back I up to where you. we were. Yeah. But like the it, um, Blake, you talked about having one communal loaf of bread. Mm-hmm. I miss that. I do too. Our people miss that. I have been told, when are we going to go back to having hmm. one loaf of bread and one cup of juice that we all share? Well, the answer is not yet. Yeah. One day, and, and, but just not yet. And I think that that's part of the that's part of the issue here that's being brought up in this article. And I think that pastors uh, need to really come to grips with is the idea of quote unquote go back. We, we keep hearing that, you know, uh, and, I, and I think that what, what I've been trying to, to help, um, you know, myself, my wife, my church family, what I've been trying to help us all to see is that we are never going back. We, we might in the future do some of the same things that have previously happened at our church, but we're never going back. Uh, at, at the beginning of the year, this year, I, I held a, a, a meeting you know, at, at the church uh, that uh, really laid out just some vision for, uh, for 2021 and moving forward. And I, I, I actually showed a slide with a gravestone with the word Norm Al on it. And I said, this guy has died. 
he he's no longer here and, and we can mourn him for a short time normal has now been you know he's gone and we need to just kind of mourn that for a short time but not idolize him and not set him up to say uh, we need to get there or else nothing you know we're, we're not worshiping if we're not doing it the way we were the way we used to so uh so, i mean that that's a really tough that's a really tough thing to to set behind us the the article spoke about habits and i'm afraid that even as worship leaders we fell into habits prior to covid well especially and the nuns <laughs> the, yes oh, yes sorry. the nuns that were was, always i'm, I'm yes. sorry that was <laughs> uncalled for somebody had to say it that was yeah, somebody sorry. had to go, say i'm it. sorry carl go but ahead. but the fact is i wonder how much of what we were doing in worship we were doing out of habit and now that we are coming back right. to um yeah communal worship we are recognizing the value of the fellowship part of worship that is worshiping in community encountering christ in community and yes our numbers may be smaller right now but it's almost like there's more of a concentration of a hunger Hmm. for that holy encounter in the sanctuary than there was prior our choir sang last sunday for the first time since before we closed the doors for COVID. And as they sang, I actually broke down and cried. I wept in joy just to hear voices of the choir harmonizing and being lifted up to praise God. And in that moment, I experienced God's presence in the church. And that is what I think was beginning to not be a critical part of worship prior to COVID. We thank you for joining us for this first segment of Faith Matters this morning, and we'll be back right after these messages. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the Talk Station. We do hope that you are preparing to join together with your church family to worship the risen Christ today, just as we were talking about in our last segment, the importance of family, of community, of the of the body of Christ gathered. Well, uh, today we are going to take a look for our second article at a piece coming out of the Christian Post online entitled, Worship Leader No Longer Supports Hillsong, Elevation, Bethel Music, over, quote, false gospel message. This is written by Jeannie Ortega Law, and she begins her piece by saying, Tennessee recording artist and worship leader Mackenzie Morgan has gone viral after she posted on social media that she can no longer, quote, stay silent about what she says are heretical teachings of groups such as Bethel Music, Elevation, and Hillsong Worship. In a July 12 Facebook post, Morgan, who leads worship for Refined Church in Las Casas, Tennessee, criticized what she dubbed the, quote, false teachings in some of today's most popular worship music. As of Tuesday afternoon, her post had over 10,000 shares. After spending time studying mainstream worship music, the 24-year-old worship leader said she, quote, was met with a terrible feeling of grief and sadness for what I was supporting, close quote. She then specifically named popular worship groups Hillsong, Elevation and Worship, and Bethel Music. She wrote, Quote, maybe it's time we start looking at the scriptures to see what God truly calls for in worship and get over what we want. Those stressing the problems with modern worship music are too numerous to list. Morgan specifically called out the teachings of Stephen Furtick, the lead pastor of North Carolina megachurch Elevation. Morgan went on to express her discomfort with Bethel music, a criticism she said, quote, should be pretty obvious. Morgan continued, Theology matters. I can't even stress that enough. It matters if a song is weak in theology and is not accurately displaying the holiness of our God. It matters if churches are spreading a prosperity gospel that is different from the gospel found in Scripture. It matters that each Sunday churches pay royalties to these churches in order to be able to sing their music furthering their outreach and their false gospel message. 
The singer said she regrets having supported these churches by singing their songs and, quote, opening up the doors for others to discover their false teachings. What if the majority of the church is leading its people astray singing music that is less than worthy of a sovereign and holy God, she asked, citing Leviticus 10 verses 1 through 3, which speaks of God's disapproval of false worship. Morgan urged people to compare worship music with scripture. There are no gray areas in God's word, she declared, and she concluded her post by recommending songs from worship groups such as City of Light and Sovereign Grace Music. Well, th this is uh, an interesting piece uh, that gets, uh, as the as the uh, author wrote here, the journalist wrote, uh, that went viral uh, on on Facebook and social media uh, regarding uh, this uh, this person's. Uh, declaration of, of uh, some of these uh, churches and their music and uh, their uh, media out arms uh, having uh, gone uh, heretical, uh, as she puts it. Uh, uh, gentlemen, let, let me just kind of uh, put out there from the beginning that Open Door Baptist Church, uh, the way that we handle these sorts of questions, and then this is not a new question, but the way that we handle these questions is that we really look at the song piece by piece. Uh, um, what about what about you guys at, at Liberty Church? Do you kind of take it wholesale, whole cloth, or, or do you look more at the at the piece? No, itself? everything has got to be it's got to be piece by piece. It's got to be the lyrics. It's got to it's got to match up with theology and everything. But can I just say? Do we still want to say things go viral like post COVID? Is this still a thing, or you know, I don't that's know if there's a, good, a different that's term. A good question. Um, we might have to come up with something different. There, there are a lot of ways that you could pick apart this. I find it interesting. You know, if you read her whole post, she posted it with a picture of herself, which is just interesting for a worship post. And then you go there, and she she says, "Would God be pleased with our lights, and would He be pleased with our smoke machines?" But in the picture she posted, there's haze. There are lights shining through a smoke machine. And so, so now I don't think that she is purposely trying to say all of these things are bad. I think she's trying to cut to the motive of what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. And that does tie into what we were talking about before. This is a post COVID era. What do we need to do? And so it is part of what is the message there? What is the theology? And can you trust them as a whole? The last thing that I would say is, and I don't really have an answer for this, but do you guys use other people's sermons when you preach? Because it's just interesting to me that for so long, the way that the church has done a worship service is we write our own sermon, but we sing somebody else's song. That's a fascinating point, Blake, because certainly I would not preach somebody else's sermon. I mean, you know, God has placed me in that particular spot on that particular day to bring a word to that particular people in those particular circumstances, yes. you know, and it, it, he speaks through my heart. Uh, I guess the question would be, does the music speak through, when we're singing those songs, does that speak through our heart to God? She said early in this article, maybe it's time we start looking at the scriptures to see what God wants us to do in worship. I'm what like, a shocking I'm like, <laughs> duh, idea. you know, let's, <laughs> let's look at the scriptures. Well, let's go back and look at the first song in the Bible. When did that happen? It happened after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. And, and Miriam and the others were dancing and they were singing, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. What they're doing is they're singing about how great God is. They're telling the story of what God has done. And that's what our music should be doing in church. Not, not, uh, and, and, and that, that makes for good theology in music. Just singing about how happy we are. Well, yes, we're happy because we're saved. And there's a certain theology to that. But there's a whole lot more to theology than just this contentment that we sense being children of God. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I can certainly attest to there are plenty of uh, times that I have been standing in a service singing a song and just paused for a moment and said, well, you know what? What I just sang, I don't actually think that that is correct or that mm -hmm. that is accurate. Or sometimes I even just pause and say, "Wait, that's just not even true." I'm not, you know, I'm just not even gonna going to sing uh, that that next part. And, and sometimes I find myself changing words to songs as, as I sing them and those sorts of things. And and listen, the, these are songs new and old. Don't right. think, do not get into the trap of chronological snobbery to think that just because it's old 
old, it's true, and if it's new, then it's questionable and you should look at it with a skeptical eye. That is not the case. I will go on record to admit that I do not like the song, I'll Fly Away. <laughs> because I think that it has very weak or poor theology attached to it. And it's just not a, a song that I would choose to, to sing. And then uh, also there are many new songs uh, that, that I think, even coming out of these sources uh, that are mentioned here, that, that I think have great theology. However, I am, I will say that I am sensitive to this person's um, kind of take on it, that we are pointing our uh, churches to sources that have other um, media or other things that they're putting out that that are not healthy. Right, absolutely. And I would say for any time you are, are, are visiting a source other than the Bible, other than the scripture, you need to be very delicate. And that's not just for the songs that you choose in a worship service. I think this goes for books that you choose to yes. read that are outside of the Bible. I right. think this goes for curriculum. You buy a curriculum and you want to teach a small group, you are using somebody else's research, homework, words, and thoughts mm -hmm. to teach your people. Yeah. And so you still have to have a skeptical eye there and you have to do it as a good shepherd of, of your people. Um, so I'm not saying that we should all only write and sing our own songs. It's just something worth looking at. Um, you know, when you take a, a look at what you're asking people to sing, Hillsong back in the early 2000s had a song where their lyrics, it was a very happy song. I want to say it was called One Way, lots of clapping in it. And they said, take me, make me, break me, mold me more and more like you. And I just remember thinking every time I sang that happy song, I don't know if I want you to break me right now, God. <laughs> right. I don't yes. know if I yeah. mean what I'm singing in this moment. This? Yeah. Yes. Or I remember, I think I remember a song, I think it was by Michael W. Smith. So that, that dates it. It was, oh, a, it was yes. a while ago. And it talked about, I want to see your glory. And every time I sang that, I had that similar feeling, Blake, where I would think, if I see God's unmediated glory right now, it will disintegrate me. Yes. I, I will. I will be. Yeah. Just decimated. Oh, you're it. done that... now. Yeah, I've yeah. Se I've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. I know how that goes down. <laughs> Thanks. That, <laughs> one, uh, that, that's appropriate. One of the gifts that the Methodist Church has given to the larger church is the hymnody of Charles Wesley. And Charles, uh, Charles was 100% this theology has got to right. be right. right. Yeah. It's got to be pure. And yes. um, when you sing Wesley hymns, yeah, they might seem kind of old, but you're singing good stuff and right. you're singing mm -hmm. truths about yeah. God's word and mm -hmm. you can and and the singing can become part of the spiritual formation of the people. And that's that's important. Absolutely. No, I've said this so many times to my congregation. Nobody drives home after a church service at open door repeating snippets of my sermon. What do they drive home repeating? They drive home repeating snippets of the worship music that mm. we that we sang in the sermon. That is where we we not maybe not learn or intake our theology, but that is where our theology solidifies in our hearts deep within us. And by the way, I might also add, just as a historical note, that today is actually the anniversary of Susanna Wesley's death. So there, I'm there supposed you. to know that, but. Apparently, I don't, so I'm not a good Methodist. I just nerded out on uh, on church history right there. I hope that you guys uh, en enjoyed that. Uh, just w one final word on this to our fine and erudite listeners. Uh, pour all things through the scripture. Yes. That is our filter. Amen. What comes out on the other side is what is good and wholesome and holy uh, and useful for your, your worship. Well, with that, I do hope that you'll join us uh, for, our uh, for our next segment here on the talk station where faith matters. Standing on the shore at Emerald Isle, you can feel His presence. Emerald Isle's Chapel by the Sea can nurture your desire to know God and to serve Him. The chapel is an independent evangelical church established by the grace of God, led by His Holy Word, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and sustained by the prayers, offerings, and service of the members. You and your family are invited to come as you are and experience hope in Christ at Emerald Isle Chapel by the Sea, online at eichapel.org.
Well, welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station. My name is Blake Larson. I'm the associate pastor at Liberty Church. I'm being joined here with Pastor Bill Clear of Open Door Baptist Church in Moorhead City and Pastor Carl Zorowski of St. Peter United Methodist Church in Moorhead as well. And interesting subject here as we talk about this, uh, this article here from The Guardian. It, it says, meet the humanists. You don't have to be Christian to think of yourself as a good person. I got a lot I want to say, but let's go ahead and talk about this article first. It says, when Heidi Nicole moved to Australia five years ago, she remembers thinking, where is it? Where is humanism? The British-born Nicole had been drawn to humanism, a secular values-based movement in her 20s. In her work as a hospital ethicist, she was never far from considering questions about life, death, and the reality of being human. These are questions we all have. It says here, knowing that in the UK and in America where I'd lived, there are humanist communities and societies. I was looking around to see what my options were for getting involved in something and finding people who live an ethical life that is evidence-based and values-driven, but I didn't find anything. It says later on in the article that she herself grew up with religion. As a teenager, she identified very, very strongly with the charismatic evangelical message of Christianity. And she attended church until she realized that there were other ways to spend her spare time. It says in parentheses, she also found a non-religious boyfriend. She was 28 when she won a scholarship for a secular bioethics PhD. It says that she's the head of New Humanists Australia, and she's hoping to breathe life into the movement in her new adopted country. The organization is also a member of the Global Umbrella Organization for the Movement, that embraces democracy and ethics, reason and free inquiry, and is not theistic and does not believe in the supernatural. Now, what I would like to say here is it says that humanism is not new to Australia, but it it flared up during the Vietnam War and has, has basically uh, declined since then, and she's looking to reignite it. Now, to me, gentlemen, this sounds like it's the new book of Judges. It sounds like trying to find out what is right in your own eyes and then do it. And the problem with this is who gets to decide what's right and who's wrong? Uh, Who gets to decide what's moral? And in this article, it doesn't even make it clear to me who gets to decide what is right in this humanistic movement. Am I alone in that? Absolutely not. I I think you've you've really hit the bullseye of the whole piece and and really the whole argument of quote unquote humanism. Uh, I I think you got it. uh, You hit the nail on the head. The question is by whose standard? Where are you standing in order to say this is good and this is valuable? Yeah, absolutely. She she mentions that she wants, uh, or that the way she the life she wants to live is one of fulfillment and pro value. You know, she's a pro values person. Like you guys said, whose values? Who gets to determine what's right, what's wrong? Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Like like you said earlier, Blake. And, and this pretty much writes off the idea for a universal truth. Yeah. Unless you want to be the author of that universal truth and convince everybody that your way is the right way. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, in, in the humanist view, if you want to be consistent, then you must get back to uh, the idea that might makes right. Uh, wh- whoever can sustain their uh, you know, um, uh, values and their view of, of right, uh, uh, they are the ones who are, who are in, uh, in the right. Uh, we, we could honestly say uh, that uh, Adolf Hitler uh, and his Nazi party had very strong, they were a values-based um, uh, political party. They, oh, they yeah. were enforcing their view of a better world for everyone around them. Uh, that, that's exactly what they were doing. And it certainly uh, doesn't mean that their view was a good view. It's just in those their were their eyes, values. In their eyes, it was a good view, yeah, and that's yeah. the danger of this. And I don't, I don't know how a humanist argues against that. How do they, how do they say, well, this is not best for human flourishing? Uh, well, uh, says who? Because that's not. I mean, you, you can't right. really. You're not standing on anything to be able to argue that. You know, and, and you should live consistently. At the same time, I also want to say uh, that that I believe that the, the church is largely responsible for um, you know for this, uh, and, and that just saying that why has she not encountered um, a church which has has taught her uh, that. Uh, Well, let me put it this way. Uh, It says in in the article that she longed to get involved in something and find people who, quote, live an ethical life that is evidence-based and values-driven, 
but she didn't find it. That sounds how, like the church. How is that possible <laughs> that the church did not step up and say, we are evidence-based. Look at the yes. empty tomb. Well, this is our evidence. We are values-driven, you know, by the values that are written in this book and given to us by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and seemingly in this article, it sounds like she did not find these people in her church experience, which I hate. If that is accurate, I absolutely hate that. But I mean, you know, kind of the argument is, well, I've been to church and it's full of hypocrites. I actually think that if you're in a church, you're probably less of a hypocrite than the average person. Because if you go to a church, you're saying, I'm the problem, <laughs> but right. but I serve somebody who has the solution. And I don't know how you get so passionate about being moral and, and, and ethic driven if you don't have a baseline for what your morals and your ethics are. And it's just difficult for me to understand. How could you be passionate if you're representing something that really you don't even understand? It's a it's a nebulous concept then. Yeah. What's right think, to you might not be right to me. Yeah. I think part of what led her towards this, um, her, her search that found humanism was um, that she was finding herself facing people who were suffering and facing people who were dying in her, in her hospital work. And, you know, that, that to her, you look at that and you go, well, where's the supernatural here? Where is this this God from the sky that's supposed to come down and fix everything right. and work miracles and make everything work out right. Well, the fact is, when you're human, you suffer. Yeah. When you're human, you die. When you're human, things don't always work out right. Not the way that you think is right. right. Yeah. And so she went looking for an answer, and where she found the answer was self. Yep. Yeah, and you know what? I mean... Uh, it says, you know, in the article, something about, uh, you know, humanism has been around for a long time. Uh, I think that that kind of, uh, of course, this is coming from The Guardian, which is a very liberal p um, um, media source out of uh, the, the United Kingdom. Uh, but uh, so I wouldn't expect them to understand this. But let me say humanism has been around since the Garden of Eden. When Eve looked at something and said, I deem this to be good and of value, and I will make it happen, that that was her immediately. And of course, Adam supporting that and going right along with it, that was the beginning of, of, um, of humanism. And, uh, uh, and I think that, that Blake you know, brought up a, a really good point just a moment ago regarding uh, the, the idea of, of it's the hypocrisy in the church and saying, well, actually, it's normally the people who are in the church who recognize that they are, you didn't say it in these words, but that they are sinners, yeah. right, in deep need of cleansing and and healing right and yet isn't it interesting that the that the view that's given in this article is that it's the christians who look at themselves and say i'm a good person when in reality the teaching that most christians should and i think do have uh, their understanding is that oh no no I, like blake said i'm not the good person i serve a good master yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. I mean, so we're, we're striving for a standard that we'll never fully attain to on this side of heaven. Uh, but we're continuing to try and try, uh, as scripture says, that he would conform us more and more to the image of his son. So we're trying for it. Essentially, what she's going to do is set up her own human um, self-based church. Um, and she's going to say, we're trying, we're, we're representing uh, values and ethics. The problem is she doesn't have the backing of something heavenly, of something better than her. And there will come a time where people come against and say, well, I don't think that that's the right value or I don't think that that's correct. Mm -hmm. Churches deal with that all the time. But she's going to deal with it and not have a standard to go back against. And we can always fall back on the word of God, which is the, the cornerstone. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, she's, you know, and others in this article as well. If, if you know, if you read the whole article, you find other people mm -hmm. as well who, who sort of point the finger at the church and say, uh, oh, you should not, um, you know, s take such a hard stand and, and you think that you are the only one with truth and these sorts of things. Uh, but then immediately, as soon as they kind of unplug that, if, if they say, well, the, the church or quote unquote religion in general is not uh, the the, the bad bastion of truth, the next thing is that they immediately say, there is no God except for me. And then they immediately plug themselves into that, you know, and then they are the, the standard and whatever they in that moment believe to be uh, of value or, or truth. You know? I think part of the problem that, that people have with the church 
is that they don't see the evidence. You know, they're looking for something evidence-based. And earlier, I think it was Bill, you said, we have the evidence of the empty tomb. Well, for a 21st century, modern thinking, scientifically-based person, they say, well, that doesn't make sense. Where is the evidence of the empty tomb? Well, we have other evidence. We have the evidence in the church of transformed lives. We have evidence of people whose lives have been changed for the better through their relationship with Jesus Christ. We have people here in this town, in, in Moorhead City, who are hungry, that are being fed right now because the love of Christ working through people in the churches is collecting food and going to the Hope Mission and taking food to Martha's Mission and doing things to help others simply because Christ leads us to do that. There's evidence right now. The world is becoming a better place. People are being taken care of because of Christ. Yeah, those are some of the best evidences. And I guess what I what I would just end this segment on is just to encourage you, if you're a believer and you're listening to this, Jesus gives a promise not to everybody in the world uh, in this incident, but this one is to believers. He says, they will know you by your love for one another. And one of the things that I think we need to do is make sure that we're really demonstrating that. If you go to a church, odds are there's somebody there that you don't like, but you can love them. And what happens is people come in and they see us bickering within ourselves and they've got to see that love from within and the love for those without. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us here on the talk station. This is Faith Matters. I hope you all stick around and join us for our very last segment right after this. back to our fourth and final segment here on Faith Matters at the talk station. I hope that you've enjoyed the show today, and I do hope that you are preparing yourself to go and worship with your church family uh, this morning on this fine Sunday morning. Today, we're going to end the show with a piece coming out of the Christian Post, which is really pointing to the Colson Center, uh, where John Stone Street and Maria Bear have given us a piece entitled, Is God Really on the Throne? As rescue workers still look for remains in the rubble of the condominium that collapsed in Surfside, Florida last month, the official death toll has topped 95 people, with more missing and presumed dead. While this tragedy will change the lives of those involved forever, it will, as all tragedies do, fade from the news headlines to be replaced by others. Many Christians look at our world of mass shootings, natural disasters, political unrest, and moral degradation and conclude that it is worse than it has ever been. Others say we're better off than ever, noting advances in medicine and technology and life expectancy, etc., and respond to disasters, global poverty and infant mortality have fallen dramatically in the last two centuries and continue to plummet. Even so, just as J.R.R. Tolkien wrote in The Lord of the Rings, evil, quote, always after a defeat and respite takes another shape and grows again. His friend shared a similar philosophy in That Hideous Strength, the final novel of his space tr trilogy, C.S. Lewis wrote, good is always getting better and bad is always getting worse. Because time moves only forward, and because Jesus hasn't returned to finally make all things new, we will continue to confront new and different shapes of evil. Trying to decipher which shapes are worse or better than others is as futile as trying to predict which are coming next. What we do know, because scripture is crystal clear about this point, is that God the Father sits in what N.T. Wright might call the control room of heaven. His hand holds back more evil from befalling his creation. A colleague of mine used to note that the four scariest words in the Bible are, God gave them over. The worst evil we can imagine visits humans at our own request. Any moments or eras of apparent respite is either because we've not recognized a new shape evil has assumed or because God has chosen to graciously withhold what human sinfulness has invited. In moments of great suffering or tragedy, Christians will often say something like, oh, don't worry, Christ is still on the throne. 
This is true and often comforting, but it can also be a kind of bomb aloofly and tritely lobbed over our protective walls with too little empathy. Christ is on the throne, and I might suffer tragedy. Both are true. It's the rest of the story that answers these questions. As Pastor Tim Keller writes, often we see how bad things work together for good. The problem is that we can only glimpse this sometimes in a limited number of cases. But why could it not be that God allowed evil because it will bring us all to a far greater glory and joy than we would have had otherwise? Well, a very deep and philosophical piece to to take us out uh, this morning. I feel confident that each of you, not only my listeners, but but also uh, my colleagues this morning, each of you have experienced some tragedy in your life where you where you wondered or questioned at the very presence uh, of God if if He was even near you. But can you also think of a time after that? where you saw the hand of God through and in the midst of your tragedy. Yeah, I think for me, I I had to come to the realization one day that I had just, I had drawn the wrong finish line, you know, and, and I think we all do this to some degree in our faith, what, even ministers, maybe even especially ministers. And that finish line is that we want a good life here. We want God to bless us. When we're sick, we want to be healed. When we're hurting, we want to be whole. Yeah. And the answer For is about eighty-five yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. That's and, yeah, that, that's exactly um, that's exactly it. And really, God doesn't have the same finish line that we do. His finish line is that He would get us back to the garden. I think as much as Adam and Eve missed walking with the Lord in the garden, I think He missed walking with them even more. And I think for his children, his goal is to make sure that he gets into a deep and full fellowship with him again. Now there's ways we can grow that here on this earth, but ultimately we will step into eternity and be with him. Now that doesn't mean you don't ask for those healings. It doesn't mean you don't ask for wholeness. He is a restorer. He is amazing. But to understand that that's not the ultimate goal, that there will still be troubles here, but he doesn't promise there won't be troubles. He just promises to be with you no matter what they are. We had talked earlier today about COVID's impact on the church. And, you know, my kids are teenagers. And when they grow up, they're going to tell their kids, well, I remember when the COVID pandemic was here. It was bad. Yes, it was. I remember those months when people were afraid to leave their homes. And the only time we left our homes was to go and fight over toilet paper when it showed up at Walmart, right? I mean, it was it was a bad time. I mean, I'm, I say that kind of lightly, but but we have seen a very difficult past couple of years here in our world. Um, but there have been other bad times. Think about the French Revolution. I remember when I was in college and the um, Iranian uh, you were revolution. In college during the French Revolution. Yes, I was. It's amazing. <laughs> and all I did was eat cake, right? Oh, no. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was in college and everything blew up in Iran and the American hostages were taken and they were being paraded on TV and you saw the riots and the American flags and the president being burned in effigy in Iran. And I thought, could it get any worse? Could the world get any worse than it is right now? We think about 9-11. What a horrible time that was. But, you know, we've had other horrible times. We're going to continue to have horrible times, but God hasn't changed. I think somewhere in this article, it talked about how evil doesn't go away. It just sort of changes its face. You know, we, we just confront, we don't confront a different evil. We just confront the same evil in a different form. And God is always going to be sovereign and always have power over that evil. It does cloud our vision when we are in the midst of that, you know, and, and it's, I think it's part of the reason why we're so often um, told in scripture to remember, to remember God's goodness, because in the future, you are going to go through times where you cannot think clearly, you cannot see clearly because of what's swirling about you. And you are going to need to hold on to some of those stakes in your life where you said, no, no, I, I remember another time. I remember when God, you know, Took, took me through this. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the 
One of the, um, the, the stories, one of the, the historical accounts in Scripture, which, uh, which paints uh, one of the greatest you know, tragic lives, uh, you know, lives that, that we see in Scripture, is that of Job. Everyone knows Job's story of tragedy uh, in his personal and family life. And yet, listen to the commentary that James gives uh, of the life of Job in uh, James chapter 5, Verse 11, he says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And now listen to this. You have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Mm -hmm. That's what James says God was doing in the life of Job. He was, he was showcasing his compassion and mercy. Because if, if Job had never uh, had the tragedy, then God's uh, mercy would have never been evident. You, you cannot see the saving arm of the Lord if you're never in danger and, and in need of rescue. That's true. And the cool thing about Job is he, he questioned a whole lot. He never right. questioned God's goodness. Yeah. He questioned a whole lot uh, about his circumstances, though. It, it always scares me towards the end of Job when, when God finally does show up and he answers them from a whirlwind, mm -hmm. which alone is terrifying enough. And depending on your translation, you know, he says, hey, brace yourself like a man. I have some questions and you're going to answer them. Right, right, and 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 look at look at Job. Job is Job is willing to stand up there and look at God and go, why, why is all why why me? And God goes, who do you think you are to ask me that question? Where were you when I did all of this? You know, I think back to when I was at my lowest during my cancer treatments. Could I even see God in those moments? No. Did I even feel like he was on the throne? No. I felt very lost. I felt very alone. I knew he was there, but everything that was happening around me had put such a dark blanket over me that I couldn't even I couldn't even reach him. But yet I could look back on my life and say, but he's always been here. And I know that when I get through this, he's going to be there. And he was there through the whole thing. Yeah, he was there through the whole thing. And as this article is really focusing on, not, not only was he there, but he was on his throne. Think, uh, it, listen, this is is a pattern throughout uh, Scripture and throughout the revealed history of God dealing with his people over and over and over and over again. God puts us into difficult and, and painful situations uh, which bring our cries and our prayers to him to see him as merciful and compassionate and rescuing and powerful. God is sovereign on his throne and we, he can, he can handle our crying out, our crawling up into his lap and beating on his chest and saying, why is this happening to me? Are you even there? So I would just like to encourage you, uh, our listeners, to do that very thing. Call out to the Lord today. I hope that you're doing that with your church family and with a body. And I hope that you'll join us next week for another Faith Matters here on The Talk Station. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. To revisit today's program or to find more episodes, visit thetalkstation.com. Give me faith, trust what you is a production of the talk station.